The Unshackled Waves, episode 124. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It's now February 2018 and the Australian political year is well underway with major developments throughout the week. We learned some disturbing detail about the federal government's proposed foreign interference laws. Bill Shorten announced he will create a federal ICAC. Two filing cabinets full of sensitive government documents turned up at the ABC and Labor MP David Feeney was the latest MP to resign in the dual citizenship saga. To discuss the return of the political year, we thought we'd invite back on the show social media personality and vlogger Libby Down Under. Libby, welcome back to the show. Pleasure to be here. Now, we know that it's the end of summer, uh, just not because the, the weather started to cool down a bit, because uh, Australian politics is also back, and it was a, a big news week. We'll start uh, in chronological order. The, uh, the first mm-hmm. uh, announcement of the week was the foreign uh, interference laws. Uh, uh, the draft was uh, released. Now, they're to crack down on foreign influence in Australia, namely from uh, China, because obviously we saw the... Uh, Sam Destiari uh, scandal last year where he was uh, appeared to be uh, an agent uh, of the Chinese which of course led to his uh, Mm -hmm. uh, resignation Uh, but on closer inspection these uh, foreign interference laws they they do uh, place uh, quite a draconian regulations on political advocacy groups Uh, any donation which is to an organization which engages in political advocacy if it's over $250 a year will require a statutory declaration which which is you have to go to a justice of the peace to uh, get that down at the police station during uh, hours, which they're then. So it's so it's not an easy task, and it applies to any group spending uh, more than a hundred thousand dollars on uh, potential election issues. So it's really going to have an effect on uh, you know, any uh, group that or you know charity that. Uh, has you know commentary which is has a slight political bend um so i mean the details we've yet to see um all the details come out but in the fullness of time we'll see them um and by the looks of it i mean without you know it's all all we can do is speculate uh, as much as we can for time being of course um, when the government introduce um, more legislation, new legislation, oh, you know, um, Sam Dastari, you know, um, he did something or he, you know, he was being a problem child. So therefore, let's try to solve government problems with more so-called uh, uh, government solutions. And um, whilst we haven't seen the legislation, so far, it isn't looking good, and this is just a classic case of um, government trying to solve issues that um, started within itself, but potentially could have unintended consequences, thereby um, contributing to the growth of government. Um, I see this just another classic case of government growth, um, not necessarily to the benefit of the Australian people. Um, it, the details are sketchy, um, and, and it's not necessary just because the legislation, we haven't seen the bill go through the parliament yet, um, but by nature, when you try to legislate a problem that's inherent of government, then, you know, whilst we haven't seen the legislation yet, it, it'll probably, when we see the details, it'll probably be less than ideal, and it will have more or less unintended consequences um you know it's just history repeating itself um but no no real surprises i've from what i've seen the media reports the thing that jumped up at me the uh, the most and i'll um i'll I'll just uh, quote from it um so in one of the media reports i read it would be a criminal offense to uh, receive classified information without authorization um, and up until now, it's only 
uh, been a crime to share that information. Now, of course, you get a piece of sensitive information and it looks like you shouldn't have received it. Obviously, common sense says don't share it. Um, if that media report is to be, uh, believed, I mean, who's to say, if, say someone's got something against me and they're willing to uh, risk themselves by sending sensitive information to me, um, thereby I get caught up in these new foreign interference laws and all of a sudden I'm branded a criminal. So how uh, my question in that instance is, if that's how the legislation is going to pan out, how is that fair to me? I mean, that's probably far-fetched, but, uh, I mean, when they came up with the um, Racial Discrimination Act in 1975 and they had Section 18C, the, the, the intent was good. The intent was, well, we don't want people's feelings to be hurt. Now, we saw what came out of the QUT case under Section 18C, Again, a classic case of government trying to legislate a problem and falling out of that is unintended consequences, e.g. the QUT case. So, again, I, I see parallels here. Uh, if this legislation, regardless of what the details are, I'd imagine that there will be parallels um, from a unintended consequences point of view. Well, going back to the uh, foreign uh, donation uh, laws, which is uh, part of this legislation, it is clear that the the government is motivated in part to you know get uh, organisations it doesn't like, uh, such as uh, GetUp, who you know have been very successful in defeating uh, conservative candidates uh, uh, at elections. And I'm of the opinion if you don't like what GetUp does, then you know better uh, get out and campaign uh, better yourself. Uh, and it's also interesting that the the Institute of Public Affairs, the free market think tank in Melbourne, who you know they're quite close to uh, the Liberal Party, they also oppose these uh, new laws, even though they themselves may be exempt from them as an academic organisation. But of course, the the legislation is it's draft it's drafted so uh, ambiguously that you d uh, we don't know and also um, news media is also exempt so uh, you know people like you and me we wouldn't be you know f uh, forced to you know disclose you know who uh, you know uh, gi it gives us money which uh, you know but but still this uh, th th this will have the the effect of you know both crippling uh, grassroots democracy uh, and campaigning and also uh, infringe upon basic uh, you know, civil and political rights. Yeah, uh, you touched on grassroots um, campaigning, grassroots in what we're doing right now, commentary. Um, again, I'm not too familiar with the details, but I think you just mentioned... Um, that media organisations are exempt. I mean, we live in the age where um, the days, the heydays of the mainstream media, um, no, they're, they're still around, but it's not what it used to be, and you've got the growth of alternative media, uh, for example, The Unshackled, and um, I, I couldn't speak on uh, behalf of The Unshackled, but at my end, uh, I'm not funded, I'm self-funded, and then it becomes, oh, I'll be interested to know the uh, legislative details in that area because then someone like me um, doing Libby Down Under self-funded in my own time, um, where, where would I and others fall um, from a legislative point of view? Because thanks to the age of um, social media and the internet, um, what used to be clear and cut is now a grey area, again, thanks to the rise of the internet and social media and who knows what will come out of this um, as technology develops in the future. And again, you know, um, it's not like the legislation can foresee what that, you know, the media, what the media looks like in the future, but um, it'll be interesting what the details are. Again, unintended consequences will very likely fall out of this. And of course, the the overall question is: Do we really need you know such uh, foreign interference laws? Because I'd say we already live 
in a, a day and age when you know both uh, you know the government and the public are very uh, suspicious of you know foreign uh, foreign influences in our uh, democracy and government and uh, you know they have, the government's using the example of you know Sam Dastyari this is why we need these laws but of course you know Sam Dastyari was you know found out and he's now out of the parliament so you know the the system already weeds out these people and do we really need to you know basically uh limit or uh you know put put stricter controls on the workings of uh democracy to you know make sure that we can 100 percent wipe out because you know what is you know like for, uh, foreign interference it's it's when it's a direct you know foreign government that's trying to influence an a uh, an australian decision like uh, i don't think mm -hmm. you know just because say you know some you know some money uh, f uh from a group uh, uh, over overseas ends up in australia that that's not they're, they're not acting on behalf of a foreign agent it's just you know yeah for example if they're a charity that's just part of their you know cha uh, charitable business to you know give money to an organization in another country but you know if they have a hint of you know advocacy and what they do then they could fall afoul of these laws um yeah, look, if you go back to six to 2016, Cory Bernardi had caught out uh, on Sam Dastyari. Um, and about one year later, um, it turned out that there were good reasons to suspect what, um, uh, well, he's now Mr Dastyari, not Senator Dastyari. But again, it proves your point that in a free market of ideas, in a democracy where um, people can speak freely and therefore um, people, you know, there aren't um, generally uh, unreasonable restrictions on criticism and uh, scrutiny of especially public figures, these things pan out like they do in any free market situation. So, I mean, I take your point. Um, the free market of ideas, the free market of criticism, scrutiny, speech in a democracy um we didn't have foreign interference laws um in, in the last few years and eventually um mr dastyari he got um he was found out he was caught out on it and he eventually resigned so perhaps the system already does its job and therefore again interesting to see what the legislative details are, will be but what value it will add to the free market of ideas to democracy, I, I doubt it will add much value at all. Yeah, I, I should give a small specific example. Like what if you want to, you know, save, you know, like heritage, you know, listed buildings in say Sydney and, you know, you're from New Zealand, but you frequent, you know, Australia a lot and you give money to, you know, a heritage organization that that's now considered foreign interference even though it's something you know it, it, it's not it's not something sinister that you're doing no and obviously we live in the age of uh, globalization and i think sometimes in discourse there's a conf there's a tendency to conflate globalization with globalism of course uh, we should be wary of globalism and um, you know, some of the folks pushing for, you know, some folks on the globalism brigade, um, the agendas that we're pushing for certainly should be up for scrutiny. Um, but there is a difference between globalisation and uh, globalism. Uh, globalisation is here to stay. And the example you gave, the New, New Zealand example, that's an outcome of globalisation. I mean, you bring about this legislation, um, what's next? Because we do live in the age of globalisation. That's not going to be reversed anytime soon.
Uh, Bill Shorten, in his uh, first speech to the National Press Club this year, uh, proposed a National Integrity uh, Commission, which would look at things uh, such as uh, parliamentary uh, expenses, uh, the conduct of uh, public servants, and of course, uh, the effect of political uh, donations, which it would work uh, like a, a federal ICAC, which for people who don't know, ICAC is the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption which a lot of people have been calling for one at the uh, federal level for um, a number of years now, and it would have the powers of a standing royal commission. Now, you know, obviously we want our, our leaders and public servants to be held uh, more account accountable, but uh, ICAC has had a checkered history because it itself is not very accountable, and it uh, went off on a huge uh, tangent when it went after uh, Crown Prosecutor Margaret Keneen over uh, whether she, you know, instructed a, her, uh, I think it was a daughter-in-law, to uh, avoid a uh, breath test. But it has done uh, good things, such as you know, investigating and you know, having findings of corruption against uh, people such as Eddie Obeid and uh, Ian. McC Donald. Um, look, yep, I'm aware that there's been calls for a federal ICAC for years, um, and whilst I've always been tempted to be inclined to support the idea of a federal ICAC, um, one, I mean, like you've just pointed out, one, as we've seen in New South Wales, mixed results, that's, that doesn't mean it's been all bad or mostly bad. But it has been a mixed result. I think the push for a federal ICAC, for any ICAC for that uh, matter, um, I think it's asking the wrong question. I think the right question uh, to be asking is, the, you know, it, it would pertain to the size of government, the growth of the size of government. So the question, I mean, it's still a valid question to ask, do we need an ICAC um, to keep basically keep an eye out on the workings of government? I think a better question to be to ask is: Is government getting too big? Is the growth of the size of government getting so big that you know we're still talking about whether we should have a federal ICAC or not, or just any ICAC in general? And you know how better we can make an ICAC? Of course, the bigger you grow a government, as a general rule, the more likely you'll see government corruption, um, inappropriate use of government resources, etc. So if we must have a federal ICAC uh, to do the good that uh, it can do uh, from a corruption point of view in government, I, I, I would somewhat be inclined to support that. But I would ask a question at the same time. We really do need to ask the question at the same time. Has government gotten too big? Has the growth of the size of government um, gotten too big that that's something else we need to look at? Because, you know, if we don't look at that, a federal ICAC then just becomes a Band-Aid solution. And you can only Band-Aid so much until the whole system uh, falls apart. That's a bit, of, a bit of a hyperbole, but you know what I mean. Well, the argument against ICAC has been that it operates as a star chamber and becomes a, a organisation which, you know, engages in, you know, witch hunts. And if, you know, you're called before, you know, ICAC, uh, you know, you're already presumed to, you know, do something wrong because it drags in, like, not just government people, but also, you know, businesses that deal with government. And so it can really, you know, damage your, you know, business uh, reputation and, you know, you have uh, no recourse. That, against that even if you're cleared you know by you know ICAC in the end as the expression goes the 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 process uh, is, is the punishment so uh, uh, there is and you know I'm skeptical of you know royal commissions a uh, period because uh, 
this uh, you know national integrity commission and any royal commissioner can't you know bring charges against uh, people that compel people to give evidence and make findings and recommendations but but that's it the the power to um, you know punish wrongdoing lies with the judiciary and to you know reform uh, you know the systems of government you need politicians to pass laws yeah, so I would be more supportive of, I mean, if I had to choose between a federal ICAC and royal commissions, I would be more supportive of royal commissions because royal commissions, um, historically, they've also been subject to similar criticism to what you said, um, uh, you know, the trial by media um, uh, kind of concerns that you've just raised. Royal commissions, which are called every now and then, um, if they're subject to, if they're every now and then subject to that criticism, I mean, it, it, it's an indicator that perhaps if we're going to have a federal ICAC, we need to think very carefully how it's structured. Otherwise, you have um, instances, maybe too many instances, where people are dragged through the federal ICAC and it turns out that they were innocent in the end. And then it's like, well, you can't really undo the damage, can you? So a federal ICAC in that sense would give permanent, in a way, be given permanent legitimacy to um, do that, uh, to, to, to do the trial by media, to give rise to trial by media every now and then. Um, is that something that we, sh you know, taxpayers should be funding for? I mean, I know that corruption is uh, is a concern, but uh, on this front, a federal ICAC isn't necessarily, um, uh, you know, the solution. Uh, but, uh, you know, debating the merits of, you know, whether a federal ICAC, uh, you know, is a good idea is one thing, but I, I believe that the politics of the matter is that, uh, you know, one way or another, you know, we will eventually get a federal ICAC because, you know, in the public, you know, of course, they're going to favour a body which, you know, holds, you know, uh, uh, politicians and uh, the government uh, more accountable. And now that, you know, Bill Shorten said, you know, if I am uh, elected, we're going to do this, the pressure is now on, you know, Malcolm Turnbull to, uh, you know, he, at the moment he's saying, oh, I don't think we need one. We've already got, you know, a strong uh, Senate and anti-corruption measures. But I think, because uh, this is what happened exactly with the Banking Royal Commission. I mean, Labor and all the other parties, you know, pushed for a Banking Royal Commission. Turnbull resisted for months and months before eventually caving in. I think that that's what will happen here. Turnbull will tell us for like three or four months, oh, we don't need a federal ICAC for these reasons. And then he'll eventually, uh, you know, say, OK, we're, we're setting one up. And so if it... If, you know, it'll eventually happen, you know, under a Labor government, but it's most likely to happen when, you know, Turnbull eventually sees the politics of it and says, oh, I better do this. And what would be funny, if, if this is going to happen, what would be funny, if history is an indicator and history repeats itself, it would be funny in the sense of, I mean, let's look at ICAC and how it, when it was introduced in New South Wales. Um, it was so in New South Wales, Labor was in government in uh, the 80s. Then in the late 80s, I think it was 1988, uh, the New South Wales Labor government was voted out. Um, Nick, yep, it was Nick Greiner and the Liberals, uh, they came to power with a promise of um, introducing a New South Wales ICAC. Then a few years later, the same ICAC that Nick Reiner was pushing for from opposition um, found, I believe, found Nick Reiner, Nick Reiner and a number of Liberal ministers, um, there were adverse findings. So I guess uh, the human that is um, Bill Shorten should be careful for what he wishes for because it might come back to backfire him. And, um, I mean, knowing him politically and... Labor politically and the policies that's that they stand for, um, I think I'll have a bit of a giggle if history repeats itself. Yeah, that's what a lot of people have been saying that you know, uh, Bill Shorten and integrity uh, in the same sentence. It doesn't doesn't go well <laughs> together. 
and as people say, risk, uh, history tends to repeat itself. So, again, he sh I, I would suggest he be careful. He be, he be careful of what he wishes for. <laughs> The humorous political story of the week, well, you know, <laughs> you can look at it as humorous, but also uh, sad, was that uh, it turned out uh, the ABC released a series of cabinet leaks at the beginning of the <laughs> week uh, uh, from the, the Abbott government, and people were saying, you know, oh, where, where's these leaks coming from? Is it coming from, you know, Turnbull? Is the Liberal Party going through another, uh, you know, uh, period of uh, destroying itself? But it turned out that these leaks actually came from uh, two locked uh, filing cabinets that were full <laughs> of uh, confidential uh, government documents that were sold uh, for a small change at an op shop in Canberra because uh, they, uh, they couldn't find the keys to it. So uh, these two filing cabinets were bought full and they sat idle for a number of months until someone uh, attacked them uh, with a drill and found all these, you know, the, the hidden secrets of Australia and they ended up in the hands of the ABC who uh, on, on the Wednesday eventually fessed up and say, hey, this is where this information is coming from. And they established a whole section of, of their website uh, dedicated to these documents called the Cabinet Files. And it didn't just include information about the... Uh, the Abbott government um, that they considered cutting off welfare to those under 30s that uh, Scott Morrison wanted to slow down uh, asylum seeker uh, applications. They also contain information about the Rudd Gillard governments that you know Rudd was warned about the uh, home insulation uh, program before uh, it started started killing people, and even went all the way back to the Howard government about they wanted to take the right to silence. Uh, uh, away uh, uh, from uh, terror suspects, and you know everyone just couldn't believe it that a you know government department. Uh, we learned it came from the prime minister, uh, department of prime minister and cabinet. That you know they they didn't bother to check that uh, these cabinets were empty before they you know flogged them off to uh, an op shop. And look, that comes down. This comes down to human uh, error. I'm not trying to say that. Uh, there weren't any wrongdoing, but um, these things happen. Hopefully, they don't happen too often. Um, in the age of information technology, uh, you would hope that, I mean, it, it is, we're talking about government, we're talking about a bureaucracy um, that may still have a tendency to latch on to um, the workings to do, you know, the, the workings that are paper-based. Um, in the digital age, and uh, uh, you know, hopefully, um, this isn't going to be common occurrence in the future. Because uh, hopefully, whatever processes that are in government, you know, whatever paper-based processes are, are, are left, that they do, that they, they, that they are discarded at some point shortly. And um, and you know, we can welcome the bureaucracy, we can welcome government into the, the uh, 21st century because. Um, that's how you avoid these in instances where you print stuff out on paper, lock it up, and, well, okay, um, we don't know the key for it, so uh, off it goes on its merry way. Whereas if these um, cabinet files, if they were, you know, viewed digitally and kept digitally, it'd be much easier to manage, you know, to avoid any security risks from that point of view. Um, so, yep, it's funny. It's not too much of a surprise. It would be more of a surprise in future if it happened again because, um, you know, you look at you look at the private sector, um, certainly they're up there getting on with it with the digital age. And, you know, if it wasn't um, the cabinet, if it was some other private, some other institution in the private sector, chances of something like this happening, much lower. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> A lot of journalists have commented throughout the week that uh, actually, you know, uh, government ministers, you know, staffers, other public servants, it's, it's actually quite a common occurrence for them to leave, you know, sensitive documents lying around. And a lot of, you know, leaks that come out of government, they're not, you know, careful, carefully orchestrated by someone's political enemies. They're actually someone, you know, left <laughs> left it on the, you know, uh, coffee table at the, the, the Canberra uh, cafe, which... 
Yeah, uh, uh, this is uh, you know another demonstration of just how uh, incompetent our, our our governments can can be at times, uh, and. There, what's also been, uh, I, I've heard quite a few uh, commentators discuss this, uh, probably Andrew Bolt's been the strongest voice that, you know, was irresponsible of the ABC to publish them, given that they were documents which belong to uh, the federal government and that they could have, you know, reported on, we found these documents, but not um, reported on what was in them. And, but I, I disagree. If you're a, if you're a media organization and like, you know, you have, uh, the government's secrets are in front of you, of course, you know, you should uh, publish it because, you know, your job as a journalist is to, you know, make sure the public knows as much about, uh, you know, what is going on in politics as possible. If, you know, the, if the government wants to, you know, protect its, you know, secrecy, then, you know, it should basically not uh, not be so careless. Uh, I, I'm, I have, I have, when I first heard about this story, I was disappointed that the Unshackled didn't, <laughs> didn't come, come across these filing cabinets. We would have, you know, we would have been the number one site in Australia. Yeah. Mm. Um, so on this occasion, um, the ABC gets a free pass from me because, hey, they're actually, well, they're, you know, they do their job. Um, but on this occasion, um, in a much less partisan manner, if that makes sense. And so they get a free pass from me on, on this occasion. Um, did something a bit more useful than uh, what they usually do. Um, so on, on that point, I disagree with uh, Andrew Bolt. Um, I would go back to the point that um, the Australian Public Service or the public sector in general in Australia, very big in Australia. Um, it's a big employer. It doesn't matter if it's local, state or federal. And, you know, we've very big organisations where you've got a lot of hierarchy going on. Um, you know, uh, given um, what we know of human nature, um, this is meant to happen. Uh, well, I, I should rephrase that. It's not surprised that something like this has happened. Um, and again, it goes back to the question that the uh, thematic question that I keep bringing up, um, the size of government. Has government gotten a bit too big? Is it too big that, you know, we, we're getting these unintended consequences? And the cabin file has been leaked. It's just another uh, unintended consequence, I guess, of big government, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, this whole episode is why I don't believe that governments are capable of engaging in grand, you know, conspiracies because of, you know, stuff like this. I mean, they're clearly, you know, too stupid to, to be able to pull something off. And uh, a lot of journalists have said, you know, when choosing between, you know, a conspiracy or a stuff up, uh, uh, go, uh, go for the stuff up. And, you know, the, the ABC, they didn't publish all of the documents because there were uh, sensitive you know, national security uh, in, in information in them. And so they, you know, they were a bit more responsible than say, you know, WikiLeaks were when they you know, leaked all those mm. uh, cables and didn't uh, blank out the, the names of uh, operatives. So, you know, you know if, if there was like a, you know, our government was engaging in a conspiracy, the, you know, the, a the ABC like, you know, <laughs> would, have, would have found out about it. And again, to the ABC's credit, um, you look at the stuff that um, they released to the public. You know, from a if I was China and I looked at these documents, well, that doesn't well, China, Indonesia, or um, some other we'll call it competitive nation, Russia, some other competitive nation that's competitive um, on competitive terms of Australia. If they looked at these documents, it's it's small fry. There, there was nothing that will release that um, opened holes in our national security. So, you know, it gave us a glimpse of what could be potentially talked about in cabinet, um, a good eye, eye opener for the Australian people. But again, this is a bit of humour, nothing too serious. And um, yeah, um, I'm not too concerned at my end either. 
Although it has uh, some uh, international intelligence agencies that have raised concerns with Australia about, you know, how the hell uh, did this happen? Because it has become a global story. And, you know, they want to know, you know, if we give you, you know, this intelligence information, how do we know that it's not going to end up, you know, in an op shop where, you know, anyone can purchase it? Um, again, it goes back to my point earlier, um, um, we're in the digital age where it doesn't matter if it's the public or private sector, we really need to be moving away from um, papers, um, from workings that are paper-based. So again, something like this hopefully doesn't happen again and the, gov the uh, public sector, doesn't matter which part of it, um, moves on from the old good old days where you would put stuff in the filing cabinet, lock it away with the key, and at some point um, you need to get rid of the filing cabinet. Oops, where's the key? Oh, dear, the um, filing cabinet's uh, taken a walk somewhere in the digital age. Something like that in digital terms is much harder. It's less likely for that something to occur. Um, so I guess for the... Um, for our partners overseas, um, if we get, if our public sector, but the, the, the more the hurry up it gets on to the um, digital age bandwagon, the better for everyone. Well, well, let's hope that that doesn't bring its own problems with, you know, public servants uploading, you know, sensitive information to, you know, publicly accessible uh, clouds and, you know, because <laughs> I can see that happening. Um, and again, it falls back on the public sector, the government on the day on ensuring that agent, government agencies that are handling sensitive information, they do have the ICT infrastructure to um, protect um, sensitive information, uh, national security information. It's up to, you know, there, there's, I can understand that there's some information uh, I have libertarian leanings and I can, but I can still understand that there's some information you don't want out there and it's up to, it, it then becomes, and I'm supportive of the view that it's the role of government to protect those national security information. Labor MP David Feeney was the latest to fall in the dual citizenship uh, saga. Uh, he uh, claimed that he'd renounced his British and Irish citizenship back in uh, 2007 when he ran for the Senate, but he couldn't uh, find the paperwork. And so I've dubbed him uh, Forgetful Feeney. And so the, obviously the... <laughs> Uh, the High Court, you know, doesn't look, you know, f fondly upon it was called, you know, the dog ate my homework excuse. And uh, the UK government had no record of him renouncing his citizenship. So the writing was on the roll. So he's uh, resigned. But uh, uh, there's now a by-election in his uh, seat of Batman, which is located in uh, inner Melbourne, which is uh, becoming uh, Greens uh, territory. Now, uh, Feeney is not contesting this by-election, basically, because, uh, uh, you know, Bill Shorten and the other uh, Labor uh, fa factional people lost uh, patience with him because uh, forgetting his paperwork wasn't the, the only thing that he <laughs> forgot last election. He forgot that he had a, a $2 uh, million uh, investment property and he also uh, couldn't tell the difference between the, the baby bonus and the uh, school kids bonus. And at a... Uh, at a media uh, interview one time, uh, he left behind uh, confidential labour uh, briefing notes there. So <laughs> who knows, maybe maybe those uh, cabinets were David Feeney's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, what can I say? It's not a surprise. I mean, last year it was the Liberal Party's turn to um, had it, well, not just the Liberal Party, actually, the, national, the coalition. It was um, their turn to, it started off with them, with their, um, uh, their number of members of parliament, um, senators who, it, it, it turns out that uh, if they weren't actual dual citizens, um, they had that eligibility for dual citizenship. And there was, you know, across the benches, there was Labor, you know, pretending that it had no dual citizens or potential dual citizens amongst its ranks and what do you know um hypocrisy all, all, all around so 
am I shedding am I shedding tears? Not really, because um, you know this is the game of politics. You accuse the other side of so and so. Uh, you better make sure that you're not guilty of the same offence. So from that point of view, happy for him to see to go. Uh, happy to see him um, go. It is concerning that um, this is occurring to. If it, this is happening in a federal electorate that is likely to vote in um, another Greens member of parliament, no federal member of parliament. Um, and what people, you know, when the Liberals came out and said, oh, you know, we won't be contesting in the electorate of Batman, there was that initial concern that, um, you know, it will be a choice between Labor and the Greens and it's like, oh, you know, well, geez, what's the difference? Um, we only heard very recently that uh, Corey Bernardi has put it out there, the Australian Conservatives' intent to field an Australian Conservatives candidate. Um, now, whilst um, I, I presume that for folks in Batman, they may not have heard, but they, I'm sure there'll be at least some folks in Batman that haven't heard of the Australian Conservatives before and um, may not um, be fully aware politically, philosophically, where the Australian Conservatives sit. Um, but hopefully the Australian Conservatives fields a um, a good candidate, a, calling, a, a candidate that's willing to uh, hit the pavement, uh, um, hit, uh, uh, hit the pavement running, um, get the profile out there, and let the people of Batman know that okay, the Liberals aren't running, but there is, as the motto of the Australian Conservatives go, there is a better way, and in this case, there is a better way for. Um, the people of the electorate of Batman. And in this by-election, uh, Labour is going to uh, going as far to the left as they can possibly uh, get away with. They've chosen uh, Jed Carney, who's the ACTU uh, pres president, as their candidate, obviously going for the star power that a uh, candidate like that brings. And already Labour's... Uh, you know, reversed its position on the or federal position on the Adani coal mine, saying that they you know uh, now want to you know revoke their uh, license. I'm not sure how a coal mine up in North Queensland is relevant to <laughs> the people living in uh, inner Melbourne and, and the the Greens. They're also trying to see how how far they can uh, push uh, left uh, Labor because they they came up with, what was it, a blatantly socialist policy to basically re-nationalise mm -hmm. Victoria's electricity network. And so this uh, here we see the continuation of um, you've got the Liberals who are now um, labor light, um, or some folks uh, I've heard have come up with the name uh, Labour, which is a portmanteau between uh, Liberal and Labour. So you've got uh, the Liberals who are now Labour light, and now you've got Labour who's now Greens light. Um, so what is the difference? Um, I'm tempted to just put all three in the category of the regressive left. Um, and in the regress uh, regressive left, you've got um, uh, the Liberals to um, a bit more further to the right, and you've got the Greens um, in a position on that spectrum that would make um, Stalin, that would make Mao, that would make Marx, um, that would make Lenin and Trotsky very proud. Um, and unfortunately, that is the state of um, the general state of affairs of Australian politics. And it'll be embarrassing for Shorten if they uh, lose this seat of Batman because you know, Labor's been in the ascendancy for the past year and if they go backwards in their numbers in Parliament, then you know, people in Labor and you know the, uh, yeah, the cheerleaders and the media and commentariat will you know start to question you know can Shorten you see the man to you know get uh, Labor back into government because he's, he still isn't well liked. I mean Malcolm Turnbull is still. Uh, preferred prime mm. minister and of course as this whole you know episode of show one like you know he told us labor's vetting process was you know thorough he's being shown to be a liar once again and so as i was saying earlier it was the coalition's turn last year it's now 
this might be the year that it's Labor's turn to um, have its uh, numbers of senators and MPs who um, turn out to be dual citizens or um, eligible dual citizens. Um, and that's relevant in the sense of, well, there's some speculation that Turnbull might um, decide or be forced to decide to call a much earlier election sometime this year. Um, the way things are going, if we, if Labor loses a few more, um, if they lose a few more MPs, a few more senators, um, maybe the federal election won't be this year. Maybe it'll be um, next year. And I, I, I mean, I'm sh hopefully Malcolm realizes that he won't be returning as prime minister at the next federal election. So he, if, if he if he is in that frame of mind. And just if there's going to be, if Labor's going to bleed a bit further, maybe he might decide, he, he might be in position to push the election date much further back and maybe it will be next year, not this year. Oh, well, it's going, uh, it looks like it's going to be another tumultuous uh, political year. And of course, uh, Parliament uh, is back uh, this week, uh, which means that, you know, who kn knows what, you know, new uh, drama will, will unfold. But I'd like to thank you again, uh, Libby, for uh, joining me this week to uh, discuss uh, Australian politics. And yeah, we'll have you no back worries. on the show again soon. Um, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder about our next upcoming event. We'll be present at Protect Victoria's Rally, calling on the state government to take stronger action on the state's African youth gang crime wave. It is on Sunday the 11th of February at 1pm on the steps of Victoria's Parliament. So if you're concerned about this issue, then make your way to Melbourne to show your support. Also, The Unshackled will be present at the Free Speech Rally, hosted by the newly formed Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be held in Melbourne at the new location, also at Victoria's Parliament House on Saturday, February 24th at 1pm. It aims to take a stand against the stifling of free speech in Australia, both in our laws and through political correctness, so I hope many of you can make it to that as well. Also, don't forget our friend Dave Palau from Church and State is holding his first major event, the Church and State Summit 2018 on the 23rd to 24th of February in Brisbane, which will feature many high-profile speakers, including Margaret Court and former Deputy Prime Minister uh, John Anderson. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.